Hello class, welcome back to B Grade Economics. This is Nate, your class leader. Let's get started. So today we're gonna to be going over one of the most important classes you can possibly uh, have, at least I think so, uh, as becoming an investor. Because whether or not you understand all the fundamentals or all the technicals or how to evaluate stocks or, or where best to put your money, the first thing you need to really start to understand is how your brain is going to respond to stimulus and activities. Uh, investor response is typically inverse of what we want. We talk about buy low, sell high, right? Everybody has heard that phrase somewhere, buy low, sell high. Well, the problem is, is psychologically, we're naturally inclined to buy high and sell low because we get greedy and we become fearful at the wrong times. The reason for this is largely our three-parted brain uh, concept. The idea is the lizard brain is fight or flight. It's that fear response. It's that, it's that survival instinct. The mammalian brain is interested in that greed portion. It's that I want more. Uh, I'll take every opportunity that I can. Um, I'm also lazy. There, there, there are things that naturally occur in that animalistic response that are going to make you make poor decisions. Uh, what we're trying to do is put it all under control of the human brain, the portion that really drives logical decision-making process and make it as sensible as possible while fitting our goals and risk metrics. So one indicator that's used in stocks a lot is the fear and greed index. And I just bring this up not because we want to review how the use of or how useful the fear and greed index itself is, but rather how that works into market psychology. We People become greedy and price as a lagging indicator of the supply and demand curve goes beyond what it can really support for the supply and demand. The price goes up too high. And so then it has to come back down and we go into the fear cycle. We go into this paranoia that it's never going to come back up it's just going to keep going down it's got a lot more to go until we've oversold the asset so far that it doesn't even make sense uh and it's now oversold so the same thing as being overpriced it's now underpriced and we'll repeat this cycle and that's the problem is that psychologically we're naturally embedded to want to get into things when other people are into them when they seem popular when it seems as though they're they, the upside is the only thing in front of us and we want to get out of them as soon as the water turns murky and we get scared. So most of these markets are born and die on optimism. And what that means is, is that it starts out with optimism and it'll end on someone else's optimism if you're making the wrong decisions. Uh, we'll go through optimism into euphoria and that's when the risk is really high because the price is up and everybody's bidding it up. And then after it starts to fall, it's a little too late and you're still in denial. And by the time it's gone down, it might be below the point at which you purchased it. And so then you're selling at a loss only for it to then revert and go back up. But you've gone through discouragement and dismay. And so you don't have any hope in it. And somebody else has bought it and they're in their first optimism phase. That is generally how we see the psychology is it's the monkey reaching into the jar to grab the pickle or banana. The monkey brain trying to pull the banana out of the jar and failing to do so because the banana and its fist have gotten stuck in the jar and instead of being reasonable and saying i can get this banana out somehow else it refuses to let go it freaks out it breaks the jar it it bites its hand whatever else the lizard and monkey brain response causes the mammalian brain response causes us to do the wrong thing and this is the psychology we have to get past as investors so this is a bull market cycle going on a general uptrend. It takes off the smart money, the, the investors who get in early, who aren't just looking to make a quick buck, but actually have a goal in mind on their investment. They'll probably get back into it once it stops being overvalued. The institutional investors in this rather cynical breakdown of the market uh, trend shows that smart money is anybody who got in early and understood the fundamentals here or just got in <laughs> because they were a holder from the last cycle. But the institutional investors hop in because they're momentum traders. They're looking for that yield opportunity. And they will only stay in as long as the yield is going to continue to rise or stay in their favor. The public gets in generally when it's too late for them. They're taking that last leg up. It's the most profitable period, but it's also the highest risk, which means that a lot of people that get in, get in on the greed and delusion phase the new paradigm at the top is this idea that it's never going to end, that we're just going to keep going up, and that's wrong. It's not what's going to happen. When you hit that point in the phase, there's only so much further it can go before it's going to come back down. 
and then people fail to get out. They go into a bull trap where they think that they're going to succeed again, but it doesn't make it up to the top again, and so it falls back down. It goes into despair. Everybody sells off in the lows, except the smart money comes back in on the despair phase and buys because it's undervalued for the trend. That is what we're looking for, is to get ourselves into being the smart money who has control of the human brain instead of being the monkey brain public or an institutional investor who's only looking for momentum and doesn't necessarily get the best benefit of everything. Now, the institutional investor might be well positioned, but they're not ahead of the market in most cases. They're behind the smart money. So in bull markets, we climb what's called the wall of worry. The wall of worry is generally this idea that we will go through shakeouts along the way before we get to the top. Because there's the fog of what's in front of us, where we know that the supply and demand curves are set up, but we don't know how the market's going to react to it. The trend emergence, the momentum that builds, that gets the first, the, 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 the long term, or the, sorry, not the long term, the institutional investors, the momentum traders in, uh, starts out early and then it falls and shakes out. Uh, weak hands, people who should not be in this market because they can't handle the volatility. If you can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen kind of statement. The reason that this occurs is uh, a man named Richard Wyckoff refer, from the 1800s referred to it as the composite man response, which is where the market acts as one unison to do something. Whether or not it intends to or not, it just does it to benefit itself. And this composite man will go through and shake out weak hands like, hey, you shouldn't be in here and they'll get out. Markets tend to move up when less hands are in the pot, and then they continue, because once the supply and demand curve proves that it has to continue on the way up, it generally gets the weak out and those who want to be in, in, and then it'll take off with less people. Uh, this is just generally a trend that happens to occur in most markets. So we want to position ourselves where we're attentive to these dips. You know, if you've heard the phrase, buy the dip, uh, that has to do with buying that shakeout, buying the bear trap. You know, the only problem is, is at the end of euphoria, you might buy the bull trap at the end. And so that's where we have to watch out for our risk. This chart right here is my favorite chart. And I think if you, anywhere, wherever you invest, put it in the background of your computer, put it as a poster behind your TV, whatever, so, uh, above your TV, somewhere where you uh, will see it, to remember the map of market cycle psychology. It doesn't play out exactly like this, but this is a pretty good map of the shape in which markets tend to respond. This is naturally how human beings bid up price into discovery and then fall back down into underpriced and then back to reality. Uh, this chart is a great map, and the only problem that we have is this can happen multiple times in a market cycle. And so we can't necessarily know where we're at in this chart, but because these trends can last for a long time, but we can identify that we are in this chart and that we can kind of identify the general range of where our risk is. Are we on the right side or the left side of this chart? So here is an ETF for American weed companies uh, called THCX. This bottomed out in 2020 during the liquidity crisis after a long sell-off uh, from a bull market into a bear market, as in 2019, uh, we, or 2018, weed stocks had been introduced to the New York Stock Exchange. 2019, they had begun to crash, and by spring 2020, they crashed pretty hard, and then there was a liquidity crisis, and that caused the price to absolutely bottom around $6. Once it did that, it kind of found a floor and the supply and demand curve began to rally back up. There was the initial shakeout, and then we went into an optimi uh, hope and optimism phase. The media took hold of it, and then as we had uh, elected officials being appointed who are more likely to legalize marijuana in the United States, this caused a blow-off euphoria top. Uh, this was obviously not the new paradigm time. We were not going to just suddenly be legalizing marijuana in a month after an election cycle was complete. So it began its downtrend. It's back down to around $12, $13, $11, which is where it's kind of bottomed out at. Is this capitulation? Is this the bottom? We don't know. We can't guarantee that. We can kind of identify that it's fallen below the trend, meaning it's oversold, and that it is in a fair value range. 
based off of the previous trend moving into this current trend. Now, we could still go down, but I get the feeling that based off this chart, there's only so much more downside here that doesn't exist without the rest of the entire market coming down very hard. So this may be a bottom. We may have identified right here that this is the completion of a market cycle. Now we could have another capitulation go down to 10 or $8. We don't know. But we do know that we are getting very near the end of this market psychology chart because of the bottom that we identified in 2020. There's also been inflation, which would, which would indicate that $6 is not the bottom anymore. And these markets have developed more value. So this is an example of how you could use this, how you could apply the chart. Here is why it's hard to tell where you're at. This is gold over the past 50 years. In the 1970s, gold became legal to trade publicly in the United States. The government was no longer responsible for the price of gold, and so the market bid it up. Because of inflation, because of monetary detachment from gold, people bid it up until the market cap of gold exceeded the market cap of the dollar. This was a blow off top because gold was not going to replace the dollar. It became very clear that the dollar was going to be, remain the dominant currency. So gold began to sell off, markets began to stabilize, inflation was beat down by 1980, and so then the gold capitulation continued for a very long time. People, the paper markets for the stocks in the 80s and 90s were very powerful, and in the dot com, we had uh, in 2000 we had the dot com boom. That crashed, and gold started to rally again. Interest rates began to be more fixed and controlled, and money began to flood into the system after uh, too much bidding up of financial assets. Then we went through a bull rally, and you can see that we hit multiple peaks in, along the way, 2000, 2005 to 2007. We hit multiple peaks along the way, and clearly people would have thought that might have been a top. But then 2008, the financial crisis happened. Deflation occurred, causing the price to drop at first, and then it really rallied. So that was a bear trap. It tricked people into thinking that it was over. And so this can happen multiple times in one major cycle. By 2011, the market had bottomed. The stock market had bottomed and gold topped. Things kind of flipped around and the stock market started to pick back up and gold had peaked out. The new paradigm problem here was that gold was not going to just suddenly become, a, again, a replacement for currency. It was al also stocks were not going to forever go down because there was real val underlying value and the government was printing enough money to at least keep these companies from becoming completely insolvent. So they had started to rebuild value. They'd started to, be, they'd started to move again and gold began to decline again. Again, a bear trap because gold is back on a rise. Gold right now is priced almost near the all-time highs as it was back in 2011, and there's been inflation. Gold would actually be lower valued than it was back then just because of the inflation alone over the past decade. So just things to think about in terms of where you lie in market psychology. Is it going to go up again? Is this a false rally? Is it already over? We don't know. Once we break all-time highs, the answer kind of becomes clear that we're going to continue on an uptrend. But for now, you're kind of in this sway area, are either right side or left side of the market cycle psychology. This doesn't just apply to stocks and commodities. Monetary assets in general, like gold or uh, Bitcoin or the uh, paper dollars, fiat dollars, all have the same problem. They are psychological assets, but gold and, and Bitcoin digital assets have a limited supply programmed into them. So they're, they have a supply and demand curve that does exist. Gold has a supply and demand curve that is both created by nature and by industry. These products have a limit and therefore they will not just hyperinflate away. Uh, with currency, you're dependent on the decisions of a government. And the problem there becomes, do you trust the government? In 2000, in 2000, or sorry, in, in 1923, the German mark just exploded exponentially, but it wasn't a straight line up. Mar the market went through a bunch of upturns and downturns as it could, tried to bid up the price of the mark. Psychology came into play here because in 1919, Germany had experienced high inflation at the end of the war. After the end of the war, People became very aware that inflation does occur. They had a small amount of depression, and then the market started getting crazy. People started bidding up the, the everything else except for the, the 
German mark because they no longer trusted it. And once they lost that trust, it was just an inevitability that it was going to print forever. And the reason it printed forever is because the government had to meet the demand of all the things they had to purchase, and so it just kept a, a vicious, infinite cycle. The only way to end the cycle would be for the German government to have just stopped printing, period. And they couldn't afford to do that. It was better to just default through inflation. So when we get into the market psychology, when we talk about what builds a market, uh, if you think of an iceberg, how you've heard 10 to 30% of it is above and the rest of it is below the water. The above the water line is when the market, uh, the rest of the ma majority of the people get into the market. The underline is where the real money is, the real opportunity is, but it's also where more risk is and it's the, it's the less visible. It's when it's, it's less clear whether or not it's going up. And so your long-term investors, momentum investors really get involved in the early stages and the leverage and the last people in, the fear of missing out people, those who are really responding to the eight brain, uh, begin to get in as things become clear that the final end of the trend is going. But that is also the period when it's the highest risk. So you want to get in at that long-term investor point. You want to get in when it's an ice cube, not an iceberg. So I hope that made sense. This is a very simple run through on the psychology of markets. It ran a little long. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Let me know what you think. Uh, leave a comment down below if you want me to just cover something specifically or go over something else. Uh, let me know what subject you want me to cover. Uh, currently, we're still in the, uh, the midst of our first trade. We halted our, uh, our, our half of our holdings of SLV because we, were, we saw a little bit of a, a murkiness up here. And we're going to see if we can get another opportunity in here. Uh, but we may get our 2,000 to 4,000 very soon. Again, you can follow me on Kobe.io and see how I manage an active account. And you can practice managing your own active account on Kobe.io. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.